Hello, my name is Deborah Hurd, and I'm here to welcome you to today's webinar. I'm the project coordinator for this event and actually this whole year's events. Um, this virtual event is a part of a year long celebration in honor of the Department of Black Studies 50th anniversary here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. By way of background, the department has its roots in the political and social activism of the 1960s and 70s. It was established in 1971, three years after the establishment of the country's first department at San Francisco State University in 1968. Like at San Francisco State and other campuses around the country, the founding of Black Studies at UNO was the result of a long process of requests, formal demands, protests, and sit-ins. The pivotal moment came on November 10th, 1969, when 54 Black UNO students were arrested for staging a sit-in in the president's office. The arrest of the Omaha 54, as they became known, galvanized the students in Omaha's Black community. Omaha's Black civic and social organizations and churches mobilized to bail out the 54 and to stand behind them in their negotiations with the university's administration. One of the students' demands was the creation of a Department of Black Studies. Two years later, in 1971, the department, this department, came into being. And here we are, 50 years later, honoring the two pillars upon which this discipline and this department was founded, academic inquiry and cultural relevance. We exist because of the courage of the Omaha 54 and the continued support and backing of the Black community in Omaha. We salute you both and we thank you. On this, the 30th day of November, and the last day designated as Native American History Month, we acknowledge that this university sits on the sacred tribal lands of the Native American people for whom this city is named, the Omaha, and that of other First Nation people who regarded this land as their communal homeland. We salute you and we stand in solidarity with you also. Today, we're here to talk about history, how it is recorded and how it is remembered. For that, we have a conversation with four of our faculty members here at the University of Nebraska's Department of Black Studies. Uh, I'll give a short introduction to each of them and then we will get started. So first we have Professor Terry Miller. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration and a Master's degree in Organizational Leadership, both from the College of St. Mary. We have Professor Justin Payne. Give us a wave, Justin. <laughs> Justin earned a Bachelor of Science from UNO and a Master's of Music from Michigan State University. And we have Professor Preston Love Jr. Uh, Professor Love earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Economics from the University of Nebraska and a Master's in Professional Studies from Bellevue University. And if you were around last week, you saw that he was the person that did our webinar last week and he will be again uh, on Saturday so he's, he's doing three in a row for us. Uh, and last but not least, and uh, logging on, will be Professor Karen Johns. Uh, Professor Johns earned a Bachelor of Science in Education and a Master's, of, uh, Master's also in Education. All four of them are native Omahans. They have a long history, long family history. And so we're really excited to see and hear the stories that they have to tell uh, with the objects and the different pieces of family history that they have to share with us. So I'm going to share my screen as we get started. All right, so one of the first things that we should really talk about or, or think about is the, the coming of Blacks into Omaha and how that happened. Um, so the establishment of Black communities in Omaha really happened from uh, some of the earliest times that we have of recorded history. 
But before we get into that, we want to start off by talking about that period uh, right around the Civil War. And so we have a document that takes us to that time period. And if you look at it, you might not be able to see what it says, but you can kind of read in big letters here, it says the Certificate of Freedom. So you can see a little bit of it. If nothing else, I think that this document shows us the importance of learning cursive handwriting. So I know that in some school systems, they are moving away from teaching students how to, to read and write cursive handwriting. But if you want to do historical, real historical work, you have to know how to read cursive handwriting because before we had typewriters, people wrote documents in cursive writing. So uh, we will proceed to see how this relates to um, what it is that we're gonna be talking about. So we're gonna blow it up just a little bit and take it in pieces. So I'm going to uh, have uh, Professor Payne assist me in this because this is his document. So uh, Professor Payne, what is this that we're, we're starting to look at? Okay, so this is a document of my great, great grandmother. And this is on my dad's side, my father's side. And my family on my father's side is actually from um, Missouri. They're from Sedalia, Missouri, about four hours southeast of Omaha. And when I was about 10 or 11, uh, my sister was about 15. My grandma and my grandfather, they sat us down and my grandmother brought out this big manila envelope. And she said, we, we were hard on you because we want you to know the history from whence you came, and we want you to understand the sacrifices that the generations before you made so that you can have what you have right now. And one of the first documents they pulled out of that envelope was my great great grandmother's certificate of freedom. And as you can see, it says this certificate of freedom is given to a Negro girl, and her name is Penelope. And at the time of the Emancipation Proclamation, she was just five months old. All right, five. so we're gonna we're gonna zoom in on different parts of it. So this is the top of it, and as you can see, uh, and I I think I've done it. Yes, yeah. so you can see the typed out, but you can also see the the cursive handwriting. Mm -hmm. So yes, it reads Office of Provost Marshal, Fourth Sub District of West District of Missouri, by authority of the United States. This certificate of freedom is given to a Negro girl mm -hmm. named Penelope, aged five months, color yellow, size small. All right, but this is the real crux of it here, this, this part of it. You wanna read that, Justin? Yes, it having been officially asserted and decided by me, that Dr. Crawford E. Smith of Saline County, Missouri, owner of said girl Penelope has been guilty of treason against the United States and thereby has worked the freedom of said girl Penelope from her servitude under the provisions of the act of Congress to suppress insurrection, to punish treason and rebellion and to seize and confiscate the property of rebels commonly called, called the Confiscation and Emancipation Bill and approved July 1862 by the President of the United States, delivered and sealed the 26th day of September, 1863. Frank Swap, First Lieutenant, Assistant Provost Marshal for Saline County, Missouri. That is incredible. He was found guilty of treason mm -hmm. for serving obviously siding with the Confederacy. So we're talking about the, the Civil War. Absolutely. So this makes it, I mean, when you talk about the Civil War and, you know, we, we often think about, you know, just the war happening and then uh, the people that were enslaved are, are freed afterwards, but we don't really look at the people who were uh, considered the property of those who were in treason against the United States. 
Absolutely. And so to actually see one of these documents is, is, is incredible and amazing for, for a number of reasons. So that's the full document again, um, after having broken it down into different pieces. And I can imagine for you, Justin, I mean, this is something that, that I mean, even the, the, the title of this, uh, and I guess this was in a newspaper or something, yes. Certificate of Civil War, rarely seen now. So it's something that is, is very, very rare, but then to have it in your family and to be able to, to, to show it generation after generation must be something that is, is you know, just something that's very emotional uh, for you and, and, and can, I don't know, I, I, I can imagine that it probably sets you on a different kind of trajectory. Like, it absolutely does. Whatever you were doing before, it's like, I, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> absolutely, it absolutely does. And the other interesting thing about that is that once um, they were freed, they actually acquired a lot of money and status within the city and owned uh, land and property and was actually a renowned family in that area during the late 1800s. Wow. So um, I did have, a, I brought out a couple of more articles. Uh, Professor Love, did you ha have something to say? You raised your hand. Yes, I just uh, think uh, it's marvelous. How old were you when you received this? Is I was this, 10 at the time. Are you the owner of these now? No, I, I just have I just have the duplicates. The the original owned copies are still in Missouri. With and the, then how old were you when you received them? I was 10. Yeah, because I'm thinking at, at 10 years old about myself, uh, not understanding the importance of things that no. Uh, you were you you automatically knew that it was important at the time. No, not at the time. No, but okay. um, after you know after the initial introduction to this, um, they felt it necessary every so often that we went over there that we always uh, looked at these documents as a reminder. And so ten was like the initial introduction, and then. It was very often after that, every time we went over there, it's like, okay, time for family history. Let's talk about it again. And yeah. let's just keep talking about it until you get it in your head and understand yeah. that this is where you come from. No, but even, no. I, I would imagine even though you didn't understand the, the true value of it, that you still recognize that it was special. Yes. And Absolutely. so, so you, you learn at an early age that there are things that, um, that are given certain value and that you treat differently than you treat like everyday normal things. Because mm -hmm. I know in my family, we had, they, there were certain books and stuff that got handed down. So even though I was a kid, I knew that the little old books that I had, I didn't treat them the same way I would treat like my Dr. Seuss book that just came in the mail. Like I could throw that on the table, but I wasn't gonna throw this, this old book because I knew that it was special. Right. So I think you kind of learn, you can learn that at a young age. And, and, and also allow me to connect some of the dots too, because you know, we learn a, a, a nicer version of African-American history and slavery. And, you know, to be able to connect, you know, what I learned to have in these documents as I got older into my early teens, like that's a part of my family history being a part of that, you know, servitude and that slavery. And not everybody can have like an, a physical direct link to that, you know, and I can actually say that I have the documentation that, you know, that was a part of my family. And it's not far from Omaha. It's only four hours down the road. This is not, you know, not that far away. Uh, with, uh, I would just say to my fellow uh, panelists, uh, African-American studies, that we should note for the uh, others who are watching that this happened between the time of the Emancipation Proclamation and the actual uh, Juneteenth date. So it was in the middle of that. It was not, and the war was still going on for another two years. And yet uh, earlier in 61, 
the president had signed the Emancipation Proclamation. So this is really, when you put it in the context of time, even more significant. Uh, Texans had not gotten a word yet about <laughs> being freed, if you want to call it that. And then also I wanted to say that there has to be some study done about what, how uh, someone 10 years old and then later would automatically mature and have a sense of responsibility that would keep you kind of grounded throughout your life when you have something like this that you're exposed to, uh, as opposed to sometimes in poverty stricken communities, not, nothing matters. Mm -hmm. And so when something does matter, it gives your core values and uh, your testament to what your family's uh, legacy uh, provided for you and you, you're kind of proof of the pudding. Absolutely. And so this, this news article that you, you also gave me uh, was from, I guess, 1963, since it was saying that uh, it was going to be 100 years old in a, in a few months. Uh, but it talks about the, the president of the Historical Society actually finding their certificate, I guess, in the archives. And so it isn't just uh, something that was special for you and your family. Like when they came across it, they even recognized that it was something incredible and, and, and fascinating. But it, also in this, it talks about her later history uh, that she married William Edward Lewis uh, in 1882 when they were 19. Uh, she, they, he died in 1828. They lived in Pennytown. Uh, soon after they married, and uh, which was a Negro settlement, <laughs> nine miles south and slightly east of Marshall, Missouri, where the couple reared their children. And there's an archive there. And I actually uh, went online and found it. So they have some documents of her life there in Pennytown. Mm -hmm. So that's really fascinating. But you think about, uh, you know, someone who has that kind of life and, and we see it from, um, you know, the point of view of a document, but then what happens to the person, you know, so here she is. That's her. That's her, Mrs. Penelope Penny Green Lewis. And she lives to the ripe old age of 95. Wow. Yeah. All right. So moving on to our, our next one. And again, we have, uh, this is another one from, from Brother Payne. So what do you have for us on this one? Okay, so this is a barbershop that was owned on my grandmother's side. So this is my grandfather's husband, uh, the family we just looked at. And this is a barbershop that sat downtown. It was a black owned barbershop. And the place that it sat, it was called Alexander's, and it sat where the Omaha World Herald now sits. All right. And this and was a part of that uh, envelope of histo history that, you know, they showed us as, as children. Okay. And so uh, what you brought to me, so this has also been published in a book, these photographs. Uh, so this is shown as the first Black-owned barbershop in Omaha that was owned by Alexander Teddy Bear Simmons, right here. Uh, my great, great grandfather. Great, great grandfather, all right. And then his son, Alvin here, who was 16 at the time, worked in the barbershop. Uh, now, do you know what kind of clientele, did he, did he just service uh, black clients or did uh, he also have some white clients come in? Um, I honestly can't remember that conversation uh, because my grandmother, who um, was the historian of the family who owned uh, these documents, she passed away in January uh, of this year, and she had battled Alzheimer's for quite some time before then. So it's been a while since, um, since we had the conversation, but uh, just from the looks of the picture, it almost feels like they just serviced African-Americans. But I I'm looking and... I mean, you can't always go by looks. 
Yeah, you can't yeah. always go by looks, and it's so, a black so and white photo. Very, very fair looking men back here. So, sure, surely. And and I and I think about um, when we had the DeWitties, when we had the the Exoduster uh, exhibit and and lecture, and uh, the. The, the, the man that was the barber there in the DeWitty settlement actually cut hair of the men in the neighboring settlement, the white settlement. So it is, is possible that they could have done both. I know some of the barbers uh, that I know of early on, like in Atlanta, would, would uh, have clients of both races. I mean, not at the same time, of course, but they would service um, white men as well as black men. So it's, there's a possibility. Absolutely. And, and just to show uh, where it was, this is a, a Google Earth image of the corner of Dodge and 14th Street. So this is downtown Omaha, where the Omaha World Herald now sits. That was the place where your, your great, great grandfather's barbershop was. So that's incredible. Oh, and, and I, I forgot to let the audience know if you have any questions or um, you have any comments to, to please put them in the chat for the Q&A and we'll get to them. All right, so the one other thing that we want to talk about or one topic that we wanna make sure that we talk about is the role of, of women in the black community in Omaha. Uh, so women inhabited a variety of roles uh, you know, we think about uh, segregation and how that limited people's ability to actually, you know, move around in the city and to have, uh, you know, a full life. But people still were able to, uh, to, to have careers, um, you know, have mobility. So who is this that we're looking at now? And this, uh, who we're looking at now is my great grandmother who married Alvin in the previous picture. And uh, she is from Texas. She was an only child, but she moved up to Omaha in the early 1900s. And one of her first jobs was at the Supercraft Garment Company uh, on 12th and Farnham. All right. And so I was able to find a picture of um, the Supercraft Garment Company. This was from uh, the 1930s. Uh, and I found this in, I think it was uh, the Jewish historical, one of the Jewish historical records, uh, Lou's Letters. And it shows this was the owner, uh, Sam Kaplan, here. Mm -hmm. So this is the place where she, where she would have worked inside of here. Absolutely. All right. So they, so she was a woman who worked even as her husband owned a barber shop. Yep. All right. So they had a two income household. Absolutely. In their, yes. 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 And so uh, I don't think we were able to get Professor Johns on where is she? I'm here. Oh, okay. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yep. All right. I'm here. I see you now. Okay. All right. So uh, we're talking about the, the different roles that Black women inhabited during this early time in, in uh, Omaha history. And so we have this, this out, well, this is the outside of the, uh, the degree from the Municipal University of Omaha. So the forerunner of the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And so what are we going to see inside? Okay, what you're going to see inside is uh, my mother's uh, first degree. She was in the very first class of UNO college graduates. As I recall from talking to her, there were only seven blacks at the time on campus. And it was not like what we see now. Uh, OU, as they used to call it, and sometimes they would even call it West Dodge High, but back in the 1940s when my mother went, it was just OU. And it was on 24th Street. And she and Mary Parks 
Rowena Jones, uh, Orly Britt, uh, Eva Mae Stewart, and I can't remember the guy's name, but they all went out there. There were only seven Blacks at the time, and then they moved to what is now on 60th and Dodge. But um, it's an interesting piece about this degree uh, because it was during the time of the war also. Uh, but mom um, was in the field of education, and she never taught a day in her life her student teaching experience was a farce. Uh, she didn't feel she was prepared to teach because of the teaching so-called experience of student teaching. What they did was put her at a school called Long, which is no longer in existence, and it was at the time integrated. However, it soon became an all black elementary school. What happened is they put her in the basement and she was to tutor students who couldn't read or write. She had no supervision. She wasn't in the classroom. She really didn't have the experience of doing the bulletin boards that we normally do with teacher candidates, as they call. They're not always called student teachers anymore. Anyway, uh, that's what she did. Nobody came out to supervise her or to tell her what she was doing wrong or right. Yet she got an A in that class. And uh, so, uh, she went on to uh, move to Washington, D.C. Uh, with the Red Cross. And then when the war broke out, uh, she uh, was in Burma, India. And that's where she met my father, Carl Wesley Johns. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I was not born in Omaha, Nebraska. I was born in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Um, Mom did not. But wait, wait, wait. So did you say she met him in Burma, India? Yeah. Yeah, because he was um, in uh, the service and he was in a hospital, it was the Red Cross Hospital. And she would write his correspondence and they just began a little uh, romance themselves. They kept up all till after the war was, but he was over in India, she was stationed over in India and that's where they met. That that story alone has blown my mind. <laughs> yeah, over, yeah and, and thanks to that union, you're talking to yours truly. <laughs> but mom never felt uh, uh, competent enough to go into the classroom. And then when she and my father married, of course, they moved to uh, Greensburg, Pennsylvania, where it was his family's roots and where uh, my Pennsylvania roots are. And um, then after they split up, mom moved back to Omaha, and I've never forgiven her for that because uh, she also had an opportunity to do something in Denver, but she felt safer coming back here uh, with her family. Um, but getting that degree meant a lot to her. She was the first one of her siblings to graduate from college. And as I shared with you, and I am, Deborah, going to still continue to look for my grandmother's teaching certificate. There are three generations, well now four generations of uh, teachers in our, um, in our um, family, um, but uh, they all have interesting pieces as to why they ended up in the field of education. Ms. Johns, you mentioned uh, seven members uh -huh. uh, who were part of the graduating class. Uh -huh. uh, now, were they all women and was one of the uh, named no. Rowena, was that who be the Rowena who became Rowena Moore? Uh, Rowena Jones, Orville Jones's sister. That Orville Jones, you remember Orville Jones? He was oh, somewhat yeah. a, a yeah. chiropractor and then he was also a photographer. It's yeah. his uh, sister. But not, uh, not Rowena Moore. No, not Rowena as you know, uh -uh, uh -uh. Rowena Jones. And uh, they would talk about their experiences uh, getting on the bus, uh, going to the 24th Street. Mary Parks, who is the um, mother-in-law of Vicki Parks, uh, was one of her friends uh, that was attending out there. I don't know if she graduated, but I don't think she graduated when mom uh, graduated. Viola Lennox was in that group. Remember the Lennox family, Preston, Dr. and Mrs. Lennox, uh, she was in that group. She didn't hang too much with the mom and then because she was older. So she kind of looked at them as being, you know, silly uh, college kids, but uh, 
she did hang right with them. Uh, All right, now let me ask you, Professor Johns, because uh, I've I brought up the your your mother's masters in, mm -hmm. in, in education. Okay. Um. So, and this was uh, twenty years after she received her bachelor's degree. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, um. So you said she never taught. What what uh made her want to go and and get the masters? Well. It's an interesting story. No mother never taught a day in her life, even with her master's degree. She became a librarian. She was a self-taught librarian and one of the first Blacks to integrate uh, the Omaha Public Library. The first woman was an Alastation who is also deceased. And then my mother came in and my mother worked her way up and she became the department head of what they call the business science and technology department. In fact, she helped to open up the main branch that was downtown that they're getting ready to uh, close. Um, she got on the job and it was really self-taught and on the job training. Um, when she started working, um, all kinds of, uh, racism was out. Um, for instance, they didn't want her waiting on them. They didn't think that she knew the material uh, and she did. It uh, was interesting. She got the masters because she always felt that she needed another degree to advance and it was more salary. And it also enhanced uh, and reinforced her credentials for becoming the department chair. In fact, um, after, let's see, mom, there was uh, Lavinia Adams, uh, Gasina Mills, uh, Mrs. Mallory, I can't think of her name right now. They were some of the, for Alice Station and Wanda Fagan. They were the few black librarians and they put them in branches. But when mom became uh, department head, that was a big deal. And I think that is why and what led to my obsession with being in Black history and in Black studies. It started when I was in the fifth grade. And of course, the fifth grade curriculum as it is now was about uh, the United States or America. And so I wanted to write something on somebody colored. Now, don't ask me, maybe that was a divine intervention. Uh, but I wanted to write something on somebody that was colored. And so my teacher said, well, colored people haven't done anything and there's nothing in the library about colored people. So you need to find something else. Well, wow. I went home and I told my mom. And as you know, the rest is history. Mom said, oh no, that's not true. And my mother wrote a really nasty note to the teacher and told her not to tell her daughter or any other colored child that colored people didn't do anything and that colored people, there was information about them. And then mom broke down and cried because she felt it was her fault that I didn't know as much as I did. Well, fast forward, mom took me to the library down in 19th and Harney and we had to go in the basement. Okay, we went in the basement and in the basement, was all the stuff about colored people, or it would be by the sex education uh, books, never just a section. Well, when I went in the basement, I was like a kid in a candy factory. I found so much about our uh, people and so much about the good things that were going on. That was my obsession ever since fifth grade, my mom being able to take me down to the library and in the basement to learn about the sex education that had nothing to do with black studies, but, or Negro history at the time. But I found a lot of colored people to write about. All right. So we're gonna shift gears uh, right now and talk about something that's very important to Omaha history and that's music. And in the in February, we're going to have a whole webinar on the history of jazz in, in Omaha. So if you're listening now, you want to make sure that you attend that. It's going to be February 3rd. Uh, we're going to have Professor Justin Payne and Professor Preston Love 
and maybe one other person on the panel is going to be fantastic. So I want to invite you to come back. But one of the places that is uh, well known in, in Omaha history and, and in the, really the history of jazz in the Midwest is the Dreamland Ballroom uh, that was here in Omaha. So various groups came through and performed. Uh, the railroad stopped here overnight. And so jazz mus musicians who were leaving from the East Coast, traveling back West, would come and they would have to stay overnight. So they would perform in the dreamland. So all kinds of people came in and, and performed there. So we have a picture of one of these groups on the inside of the dreamland and it's the Red Perkins Band. And so who has a relative that was in the Red Perkins Band? That's me. So <laughs> this is the other part of getting that information, uh, you know, and being so young because I had picked up an instrument at school and my grandmother thought that it was, you know, time that I was like, okay, now that you wanna be in music, let's show you how deep the history goes. And so Jesse Plouk Simmons, uh, would be my great, great uncle. And he is the brother of Albin Simmons, uh, both sons of Alexander who owned the barbershop. And so he played saxophone in this band. And um, I don't know, I don't know the exact history, but um, I do know that um, somewhere down the line, there was interactions with Preston Love's dad. I just, I, don't, I can't pinpoint it, but um, they all played around the same time. And so that is my great, great uncle who played saxophone in that band at the ballroom. And as you see, I was able, as opposed to using an arrow, I found a saxophone <laughs> to point out <laughs> Jesse Pluke Simmons. <laughs> so, May I comment on the picture? Yes. I, I think it's uh, historically interesting that you see uh, African-Americans with uh, what was called at this point, they called either they were called bands or orchestras. But if you look at our culture, you should be proud. Look at what you see there. You could overlook it. You just may look at the people. But what you see there is we have brass, we have trumpet, trombones, we've got uh, reeds. You see there that there are several. There's the alto sax, the uh, uh, tenor sax, two uh, uh, clarinets, uh, or alt or uh, soprano saxophones, and then you see uh, uh, guitar. That was they used the guitar and banjos for the rhythm section. Uh, the drummer with all his stuff, a piano back there. That's a major piece there, <laughs> and we should understand and recognize the significance of that wonderful, wonderful history and picture there. Who's that good looking guy? Well, he, he's almost as good looking as I am. <laughs> <laughs> as a matter of fact, he could be my daddy. <laughs> well, I want to comment on my dad and this young lady, whoever she might be. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if we're coming back to the picture of the dreamland. Uh, if we can, we don't have to do it this moment, but there's surely, uh, I, I, I would like to take a minute with that if it's okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the idea of what you just saw is the Simmons band playing in the dreamland ballroom. And it has to be put in context. There is so, there's about four or five different angles that we could do, which I could take up a lot more time than I will in this picture alone. First of all, it was a building that was built for and by an African-American. His name was Jimmy Jewell. He was an African-American. He built this building. That maybe not sound so significant, at the time, but this building was built, uh, I believe, in the late 30s. And so the Dreamland Ballroom, you go through those doors. Now, on the bottom, uh, on the right, was where most generational kids 
a little before and a little after was the pool hall. And of course, Justin, we were not allowed in the pool hall purposely, but we did sneak in. But uh, you had the street people there playing pool for money. And, uh, and that was a center point. To the left of the door is uh, the uh, Versys uh, Beauty Parlor. And it uh, ended up later being uh, the, a barber shop because Versy Bailey was married to uh, uh, Mr. Bailey who opened up this barber shop. And just for those of you who can't see beyond uh, right now, that is where the Great Plains Black Museum is right now, that, that right there on the left. And above the upstairs was the iconic Dreamland Ballroom, where every uh, uh, Dr. Hurd mentioned that groups would come by, but it needed to be said another way, Deborah, in all due respect. This place is where the biggest in African American music of its time, they came to the Dreamland Ballroom for you many can't, you reasons. Can't, you can't give it all away this right now, though. You got to save some. You okay, gotta I'll say you got to tease them for February. All right. <laughs> and so I will tease it and 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 use the left hand side of this building. You can't see. But what was there was a stairway, uh, a fire escape stairway that went to the second floor. Now go to the slide, the next slide. Remember what I just told you. That stairway went up to the ballroom and uh, it was a fire uh, escape, quite frankly, go to the next. And so there was uh, a young man that was in his mid teens. He used to sneak up that stairway. They'd always use, uh, crack the door during the summer because it was hot. And so he was, he went up there and he just sat there and listened to all the great people that came there. And that man, that young man is that man, my dad. All right. And I have a story to tell that I guess I want, I'm supposed to say, so I won't. But that was his beginning. And uh, there's a lot of meat there. My dad uh, had his start uh, in music. Uh, because of that ballroom and so many other things. Omaha, Nebraska, uh, quite frankly, was the heart, along with Kansas City, St. Louis, Denver, of, of the music, uh, African-American music. A tremendous story alone. My dad went on to play with Count Basie and many others. He, he, uh, he played with, obviously played behind all of the, the, the every singer, for five generations, every major singer for five generations, starting back with this lady here. This is 1944 in New York. There is my dad. You can't see my pointer, but my dad is in right on the left of the standing fellow. That's my, oh, how'd you do that? But that's my dad as a young man in 44. He was born, I was born in 42. So he was uh, 23 years old at the time in New York. And they're playing, uh, if you look closely, these are servicemen. And Lena Horn is the singer. And uh, that was a, a big band. You see all of those instruments. I want to make that point to Justin. You see all of the brass, the reeds. All, they had the full company. They weren't, and by the way, they were not playing looking up, they were playing looking down because every one of the musicians in that day and the day of, of Simmons, they were all read music. They were experts, ex-musicians. But I want you to think about what you're seeing here. And I give some credit to Dr. Hurd for even reminding me, is these servicemen, this 44 is doing World War II and uh, this lady here said, I will not perform for any servicemen unless the room is integrated. 
And so let's pause for a minute and see if we can find. Oh, there's a guy in the Navy right there who's African-American and some others that could be. But he, I don't know if they just brought him in so she'd sing or what, but he, she sang there. That is Lena Horn in the 40s. She was beautiful until the end of her life. And you'll see, and those, all of a sudden, those, in some cases, racist servicemen, but they weren't racist when they were enjoying that good bebop music from African Americans. And so that's a great historical picture. Again, it was in the New York, uh, it was in New York. All right, thank you, that's awesome. And, and, and I really want people to, to hear what you just said about what Lena Horne did because, um, she, she took a stand, you know, they wanted these people to go and perform for these servicemen, but then they didn't want the, the, the black servicemen to either be in the hall right. or, or anywhere near the, the entertainment. They were, they were just as susceptible to being shot and killed as anyone else. Yeah. So, you know, the fact that she took that stand yeah. is remarkable. Yeah, we, and you know, people should understand uh, how the, Negro uh, circa uh, name were treated. We were minstrels. We were performing acts. We were the we were like the circus, and so we weren't treated with respect. Even though these were expert magic musicians in their own right, she was, you know, exemplary singer. And so uh, it is important to note that that's way before what we think of as a civil rights movement. And she took a stand, as you say, that she would not, she was in demand. And that's the other part of the story is uh, she was in demand. And so when she took a stand, it made a difference in the evolution of what happened later in music as it relates to the integration of uh, the audiences. Very important point that needs to be made. So, um, but may I also add yes. her outfit? Uh, we, she, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the female uh, performers were dressed uh, really uh, scantily. You know, they, you know, they, they were try, trying again being used in a way that we would not be proud of, even though. You know, you think about Josephine Baker and some of that stuff. I'm proud of her. But she, you notice her dress, and she's conservatively dressed, not flaunting that part. She was a singer of high quality and of dignity, and she dressed and acted that way. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we're going to move to the last part of this. Uh, and we're really going to focus on this last part on segregation and violence. And so we don't have uh, a graphic for this, but I wanted, and, and Professor Johns, uh, I'm calling on you. I wondered if you could talk to us uh, because you have a fascinating story. So we talk about the archive and, and what we have for our history, it isn't just the things that are written, the things that are written down. It isn't just pictures, it's also the stories that get told. So in talking about or, or excavating your family archive, you have a, a tremendous story about the night when, uh, or the nights during the riots in 1919, oh. um, when, white men were storming through the neighborhoods. Um, and you talked about your grandmother. Okay. And the stand that she took. So I wonder if you could share that with our audience for a few minutes. Well, I will. And it's kind of, some of it kind of touches uh, Professor Love. Uh, the My uh, mother's home and part of where I grew up was at 1516 North 28th Street. And Preston's uh, father, uh, who's a very good friend of my mother's, lived about five houses down from that street. But anyway, 
1610, we were 1516. Well, <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short, my mother was born August 15, 1919. So she was barely a month old when Will Brown was lynched. Well, um, what happened was during this time and the weeks were just, uh, the whole week that Will was lynched was just terrible. Uh, black families pulled together and this is another thing that needs to get out that they defended themselves as best they could. But my grandmother said that uh, she and a few of her brothers and sisters just all moved into her house at 1516 North 28th Street. And uh, what they did was uh, they took watch. Uh, grandma remembers with the gun, uh, looking at, cause it was a big picture window that we had at that house. And they put the kids in the basement and they didn't have the finished basements like they did now. Uh, as I remember that basement growing up, it was just cemented uh, with just stuff in it. Anyway, uh, grandma and them, it was like, we'll watch, do the first watch. Uh, and if you didn't identify yourself, you had a good chance of getting your brains blown out, so to speak. Uh, the women, they wouldn't let them go anywhere. My great uncles would uh, take their wives wherever they wanted to go because back then a lot of women didn't drive and the men did most of the driving, but uh, they wouldn't let anybody go. And if they saw a strange car, uh, one person would be upstairs and somebody would be at the picture window and at the back, they were ready to fight. And this went on even over in Hamilton, 27 uh, then Hamilton, 28th and Hamilton, you had a lot of black people there and they just pulled their sources together and said nobody was going to come through their homes and rampage or do anything. And uh, I think that needs to be told more that black people did pull together and they were going to defend their homes, they were going to defend their families. But it was just horrible. It was horrible. Um, you know, of course, mom, she was just barely a month old, but she would pass down the stories that grandma and my great aunt and uncles uh, would, would talk about. But it was a very turbulent time for them. I remember over on um, of a 25th in Hamilton and uh, my mom was on the porch and with my grandfather and uh, some white guys came by and threw like a cherry bomb, you know, thing for uh, uh, the 4th of July in mom's uh, bassinet in, on the stroller. And if grandpa hadn't been there to throw it out in the yard, I might not have been here. Mom might have been dead. So it was that kind of thing uh, that happened. But yes, they were ready to take arms and throw down during that time. Yeah, and I, I think, and, and I remember the first time I heard that story and it was, it, I found it so compelling because at the time, you know, you, you think about this man was pulled out of the Douglas County Jail. Mm -hmm. He was burned, he was dragged, he was lynched. And it was a feeling of almost helplessness. You know, you had all of these, these men and boys with guns and all kinds of weapons ready to, you know, just wreak havoc on any black person they came across. And then they start going into the neighborhoods. So you, it, it almost is that, that story of being defenseless. But then when you told me that story about your grandma, so it wasn't even about the fact that, you know, and we've heard stories of men, I mean, and, and that's what the men did in Tulsa, you know, they took up arms to defend their neighborhoods. But to hear that the women in the house, were like, well, okay, so if the men are going to go out, we're going to be inside, but we're going to defend the house from inside. So if anybody gets through the perimeter, we're ready to defend the household, you know, and, you know, and, and and that they, they had guns and they were armed and they were ready to right. fight as well. Right. And, and you know, uh, I can remember my one great aunt Annie, she was a really little short little thing and she took the watch of the, of the upstairs and she would yell down, there's a car coming. So who was ever doing the first or second watch, they knew. And I'm telling you, they were ready. They were ready. 
Um, and, and I kind of laugh because I've got some of that spirit in me. Don't I, <laughs> Professor? <Miller? laughs> yes, you do. You know, uh, I want, you know, if I, Dr. Hurd, I don't know if time is spent, but I wanted to say very quickly that uh, the context of the story is that when Will Brown uh, uh, had his fate, as you described it, there were 15 to 20,000 people. But guess what? It was men, women, and children who came out to see the spectacle of the hanging, the burning, the shooting. And then what happened is that these men felt all puffed up after, after defeating the helpless Will Brown and then moved uh, uh, as, as, as in, in droves into North Omaha. And that's the context of the story. And so, and so North, and, and the North Omaha, quite frankly, was caught unawares for a very short time, but then we began to, to defend ourselves. That's a big, important part of the whole Will Brown story is the aftermath and, uh, and all of the devastation that they did afterwards because the community was in shambles after, the, after it died down. All right. And uh, in this particular book, you have uh, the picture of Will Browns. It's one of the few that's been passed, uh, published nationally about Will Brown. And then there's another one, The Red Summer, and it really features uh, Will Brown. And so I'm glad you brought up um, North Omaha. So we're going to move to our last bit of um, family history. So Professor Miller, can you tell us what we're looking at? Uh, what, <clears throat> excuse me, what we're looking at is an uh, abstract that was um, first generated in uh, 1891 until, I mean, uh, wait, 18, I don't have in front of me, Debbie. <laughs> it's, it's on there. Uh, from All 18, right, but, but what is it? 54, what, what is, 1954. What does it contain? What does it contain? It is the, it's the list of um, uh, description of the landscape of North Omaha, east of 24th Street, which uh, would be the Coons Park uh, neighborhood okay. that was um, uh, not allowing people of color to live in that particular uh, area. All right. Uh, even so, though people, there were people, black people in Omaha that had been right. here forever, but you still have pockets of areas that blacks were not allowed to uh, to move into. But this, so but this, this is basically of. is the whole history of one particular plot of land. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so we're going to go through it. Um, okay. So <clears throat> here we have um, the initial deeds mm -hmm. of the plot of land. Let's see. So we have Augustus Kuntz, who was the person that was originally given the land, September 6, 1861. So this is before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And it's from the United States directly to Augustus Coons. 160 acres by the president, Abraham Lincoln. All right, so we're gonna put this in a bit of a, a historical context. So this first um, initial deed of land uh, was given out right after the um, Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which created the, mm -hmm. the Nebraska Territory. So this was given to Augustus Kuntz and Kuntz served as treasurer. Uh, he had relationships with, with the, the federal government at this time. So he was treasurer of the territory. So he was given this land uh, to, to kind of settle it, but then this is uh, so soon after the city of Omaha is, is incorporated. So the, the city of Omaha was founded July 4th, 1854. 
-hmm. The Kansas Nebraska Act that created actually created the Nebraska Territory was, was signed into law on May 30th, 1854. So almost uh, less than two months later, the city of Omaha is created. So you wonder how something happens that quickly. And so I was looking in the historical, uh, some of the history records, and they were saying that there were basically like prospectors hanging out in Iowa waiting to run over and they were actually claiming land before the US government actually had rights to the land. Mm -hmm. So people were already engaged in grabbing land. And uh, so they were kind of waiting for the official go ahead to create a city or a town. Uh, so very soon afterwards, we have the city of Omaha founded July 4th, 1854. In, in that lead up time, the government uh, convinced, I would say, uh, the Native American people who actually were on the land to cede their land through treaty to the US government. And then the US government began giving out these patents of land. So they gave Augustus Kuntz 160 acres, which is quite a bit of land. Um, so we'll go to the, the next slide to see what happens. All right, so he got his land in 1861. Then in 1863, we see he cedes the land to Herman Coots. And he gives him the whole 160 acres. So what I found out about the Coots family is that there were four brothers that came from Ohio uh, and they basically formed uh, I don't want to say a conglomeration, but they were involved in real estate. They were involved in founding banks. Um, so Augustus had initially come to Omaha and got into some real estate. His brother Herman came. Then they had a third brother who went to New York. He founded a bank. And he made Augustus, one of Augustus and Herman, uh, trustees of the bank. Augustus went to, out to New York to help him and decided that he wanted to stay in New York. He didn't want to come back to Omaha. So he uh, succeeded all of his, uh, transferred all of his land over to his brother Herman. And Herman paid the amount of $8,000 for the 160 acres, which in today's money is like 100, I, I calculated, $175,600 for 160 acres of, of prime real estate, which he promptly began to develop into Kuntz Place, mm -hmm. which became this exclusive area of Omaha uh, that he marketed to the businessmen, the lawyers, uh, to, if they wanted to escape the rabble of downtown, then they could move to the north side and, and live in Kuntz Place. So he established like this little enclave in, in, in North Omaha for uh, the, the business and elite class. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see so many large, beautiful homes east of 24th Street around Benny, Wirt, Spencer, uh, because of the, the kinds of environment that he wanted to create for, for that particular, uh, particular area. Yeah. Uh, and also what's interesting is that, again, there were pockets in Omaha where Blacks could not uh, live and in Nebraska, because mm -hmm. actually uh, in doing research, the Sally Bain in 1855 was the first African-American female, uh, free uh, female in Nebraska in 18, wow. 18, 1855. Uh, and my grandparents moved to uh this area in 1920 and they were black okay and they had a farm in bellevue and so prior to moving uh on 21st and pratt where i grew up my parents lived on 30th and corby so you had pockets where blacks could live blacks could not live mm -hmm. and so the coons park area was one of the ones where they they could not live right uh in that so i I went and found uh, some census reports uh, 
that started from like 1860 and went up to 1920, just to give a relative idea of what the population was in Nebraska and then in Omaha, mm -hmm. and then to see how it breaks down racially. So um, <laughs> around the, the 1880s, when between 1880 and 1890, when uh, Kuntz uh, was developing Kuntz Park uh, in Nebraska, the population went from 452,000 people, so roughly less than half a million to over a million. So it doubled in that 10 year time period across mm -hmm. the state. In Omaha, in that same time period, it went from 30,518 to 140,000 people. So in, in that way, in Omaha, it almost tripled. Now, uh, one of the things that it talks about, and this is before uh, South Omaha becomes annexed to Omaha. So mm -hmm. there are these, uh, what we would consider neighborhoods now were kind of separate townships that had to be annexed and incorporated into the city. So the city, so South Omaha did not become a part of the city until 1910. So mm -hmm. this tripling in, in population is just in the main part of the city alone. Mm -hmm. So how does that work out with the racially? So we see 1920, there are one point, almost 1.3 million people in the state of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. um, 1.2, almost, almost 1.27, uh, 1.28 are white. So that's the vast majority of the population. And across the state, only 13,242 people are black. Mm -hmm. Then we get down to Omaha and we see the total population in 1920 is 191,000. The white population is 145,000, almost 146, with the foreign, foreign born white population at 35,000. But then the black population is at about 10,000. So 10,315 people in uh, 1920. Now, what's interesting is that this graphic divides Omaha up into wards or neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the, the native white population, you can see across all the wards, it's, it's pretty equal across wards. So they were living all over the city. If you look mm -hmm. at the foreign born white, uh, they live all over the city, but there's still certain areas where they're, where they're predominantly. So like in the fifth ward, uh, it's higher seventh ward, you know, less so in the first ward. But then if you look at the black population, that's when you really see the disparities. So almost everybody is living in the second ward. Mm -hmm. So there are people living in other wards, but very few. So you see that it's, it's segregated into what is the second and third wards. Mm -hmm. That's where the concentration. Yes, right. Because if you if you listen to um, uh, Professor Johns and Professor Love, they said where their early relatives lived, which was clearly in North Omaha, uh, but not east of Twenty Fourth Street, because mm -hmm. that was still the segregated uh, area or portion of the of the city. Right. All right. which was supposed to because of the uh, 1954 Brown versus Board of Education mm -hmm. uh, desegregation act that of course Omaha is no different than other, many other cities who still did not allow uh, blacks or people of color to move into those areas. Yeah, and so, and, and uh, you put a period on that, uh, Terry, really was not until the 1968 Fair Housing Act that really uh, opened correct. Up theoretically you know one of the questions right. i have uh, in the context of this uh because well first of all we should surely acknowledge that this ward those 10 or so wards 
we now have seven. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, uh, and Ward 2 is still where we predominantly are African American. Uh, uh, I should say predominantly black, because now in Ward 2, you've got African Americans, Sudanese, uh, so forth and so on. But uh, I would be really honest to know uh, because most of the people who lived in North Omaha in the way that we're describing it, uh, th the story is under the umbrella of redlining. But okay, so we're, we're about to get there. We're okay. about to get there. All right, very so good. This, this is the next document <laughs> Sorry. that we're going to look at. So this is still in that same role of, of, of documents that she has on that property. So we're looking at a deed that comes in 1946. Uh, so the relevant part of this is that uh, it says, and the woman's name is, is irrelevant at this point, uh, personally came above the above named person and it further covenanted and agreed by the persons acknowledging this indenture that we will not permit use or occupancy of our land or property, our land or property, by any person other than of the Caucasian race, and that this restriction shall be included in all contracts for sale, leases, deeds, or conveyances on all the property approved, signed, and ordered recorded herein for the periods of time above stated. So this was the, uh, there are other transfers of property, you know, after the Kuntz's, but mm -hmm. this is the one that's relevant for, for our discussion showing in 1946 with this restrictive covenant. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we talk about the, the, the legal aspects of it, 1917, we have Buchanan v. Worley, and in that case, the Supreme Court ruled that local governments could not create racially segregated residential zones because it violated the 14th Amendment freedom of contract. So cities could not, because say uh, Louisville tried to do it. The Supreme Court said, okay, city government, you can't do that. 1926, there's Corrigan v. Buckley. The Supreme Court upholds the use of racially restrictive covenants, ruling that they were essentially contracts between private parties. So whereas a, a city government could not do it, private individuals could do it through contract. Then in 1948, there is Shelley v. Kramer, where the Supreme Court finds that racially restrictive covenants do not violate the 14th Amendment, but that the force of government can't be used to enforce them. So if someone created a, a, a covenant, there's nothing to say that they can't have, they could not have that type of language in the agreement that they make. It's just that after 1948, you can't go, the person could not go to a court and ask the court to uphold that covenant. But then, as, as Professor Love was saying, 1968 is really when those restrictive covenants right. end because the Fair Housing Act, which was passed by Congress and signed by President Johnson, prohibits all forms of racial discrimination in housing. Mm -hmm. So then that rendered the racial, racially restrictive covenants uh, null and void. So yeah, this, yes. uh, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I was just saying that, that this, this deed, uh, this transfer of deed in 1946 happens a couple of years right before Shelley v. Kramer. May I ask uh, 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 Professor Payne, uh, he had professional uh, relatives, uh, Simmons and then uh, uh, his wife, where did they live? So uh, the Simmons family lived um, across the street from Charles Drew, which is now the parking lot that their house sat on the corner, right where Charles Drew is. So they didn't, in spite of their pedigree, if you will, they did not escape the redlining segregation. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I was really wondering that maybe they, you know, because of their means, figured out a way, but it was pretty, yeah, okay. It was very strict. They stayed there, and my mother's side lived on uh, 28th and Seward. Right, yeah. right around the corner from 1516. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had an aunt that lived at 28th and Seward. Her name was Sims. Okay. Uh, Marissa Sims. The, uh, uh, it might be also mentioned in this context that even if they were able to find someone who would lease or sell pre-1968, the banks would not cooperate, nor would it be uh, possible to insure them. Right. Well, we <laughs> might have to put a little asterisk on that statement. What you got for us, Professor Miller? <laughs> <laughs> My, uh, when they, uh, they were relocating people on 30th Street uh, by uh, Howard Kennedy School because they were gonna, they were expanding Howard Kennedy. So my dad saw a house on 21st and Pratt, 3622 North 21st Street, right on the corner, across from the park. Um, and he could not buy the house because he was black. <laughs> so his friend, who was white, a co-worker, he gave him the money to buy the house. And of course now it, the house is no longer under the, the cause it's 54 is no longer under the covenant of the person who said, we will not, we agree, we will not sell. So he bought the house uh, with my dad's money. And then he conveyed the, the house over to my dad. So that's how we ended up living on 21st and, and Pratt Street. And we were one of the, uh, uh, I think Mr. Haynes, uh, we were probably three, three at, in 1954, um, black families. We were the, we were the first and then, then the other, the other two. That was uh, way north. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's so, how we so ended up. Mr. Uh, Angelo Fuccio, who's an Italian uh, name. Yep, exactly. Bought it, bought it on behalf of your father. Correct. And, and conveyed it to your mother, because it, it says yep. Angela, and, Angelo and Sarah to Daisy Jackson. Yep, right. And then and then they and took then it. they went together mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. signed the mortgage. And signed and signed the mortgage. Yep, and signed the mortgage. So uh uh, so uh, it was uh, before white flight, you know, there was Lothrop School and it eventually became um, a multiracial because other people had moved into the, the neighborhood they could, uh, but not too soon after that, then white flight took place in uh, that particular area of, of, uh, of North Omaha. Yeah. So that's but, basically how, how uh... North Omaha became black. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Because again, when my grandparents moved, they they and you mentioned about uh, Bellevue. They lived in Bellevue, and uh, they had a farm in in Bellevue. So it was uh, it was it was quite interesting, and uh, many people who began then eventually being able to move into. Uh, and North Omaha. Matter of fact, the Johnson brothers, Preston, you probably uh, through your parents, the Johnson brothers, who had the first uh, film black film company in Los Angeles, California. They they were on eventually moved to Twenty Eighth and Pratt Street. Yeah, by again, Pratt was way north. Mm -hmm. uh, that was hot stuff mm -hmm. uh, to, to buy a house and be able to buy a house. Uh, in uh, Karen, uh, she's younger than I, but uh, going to high school in the 60s, uh, then uh, it really became populated as far north. We really were not to Ames yet, mm -hmm. but we were sprinkled in Pratt and Bristol and Evans mm -hmm. and uh, all of those areas between 24th and 30th with 30th. a few, you know, on the other side. 
So mm-hmm. redlining continued. It, it's just that we had so many people, the more population is that we just pushed redlining for further north and a little may bit. I, <laughs> may I add something about that redlining? What people really don't understand is that Dr. Harry Burke was one of the biggest proponents of redlining. Remember that you all, he was big. And mm-hmm. so when the city, remember when one city, one school came out and they started digging up all this stuff, it was Dr. Harry Burke who uh, was responsible for a lot of redlining in Omaha. And as you look at where I grew up um, and what have you, that same thing that Terry's family experienced, there was a petition and a covenant uh, to keep um African-Americans from moving in this house that I'm living in now, there was a petition. And of course it never did uh, do any good because we, you know, went on and we, uh, my family brought the home and, and, and bought, you know, what have you, but it was something. And remember on the sides of Lake, like the North side of Lake, there were some, some black people living. And then on the South side of Lake, you remember that Terry and Preston, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, so, so it's it's an interesting history, Deborah. It's an interesting history. Uh, Justin's uh, grandmother. We all used to play together, and uh, they were on twenty what and and Seward, and uh, it it was uh, I mean it was a mess of uh, trying to uh, maintain uh, just a type of living, and they all went through that same thing that your family went through, uh, Professor Miller. Mm-hmm. And so, and let's uh, not go too fast with uh, uh, Mr. Burt, who was very adamant and a strong uh, uh, denier of equal schools. And yes, he so was. He 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 was honored by having a school named after him. <laughs> and now, right, right, uh, he's probably rolling over in his grave because the school that he that's named after him, I, I would imagine that none of the African-American students have the historical perspective on uh, Harry Burke. Uh, uh, if there was a statue, there would be talk about, you know what? Taking it down. <laughs> well, you know, and another thing, and then I'll be quiet. When black teachers were hired, because. Uh, they uh, were hired as permanent subs. They didn't even have a contract. They were hired as permanent subs. True story. I was in the fifth grade when Dr. Burke died and the lone black teachers, the lone black administrators, the few they were, had a party at my aunt and uncle's house on Spencer. You remember Alan Beulah Grice? All the black people in the quote upper echelon black folks at the time had a party celebrating Dr. Burke's death. Okay. And I could go <laughs> into some of the names. And, uh, well, there was Wilbur Stevenson, Ed May Swain and her husband, uh, Catherine Fletcher out, you know, a lot. I'm going to respect some of the privacy because as a little girl and we're in our pajamas, the stuff they were saying, Barbara Dale <laughs> Davis, Shirley Bell, oh, they were celebrating the death of that man. And while we're laughing, uh, yeah, I laugh too when I think about it and experience some of the things, but Dr. Burke was a stone cold racist. And I have to admit that those black teachers that taught at Kellum, Long, Lake, Lothrop, uh, and Howard Kennedy, they did one hell of a job of helping uh, black children learn. They made them learn. They made them learn, but oh my gosh. Uh, some of the things that Harry A. Burke would do to the black teachers and administrators. Uh, one of the reasons that you have to, and you go into a building, well, not now, but when I was teaching, you had to put the superintendent's name down, the principal's name, and then the, the teacher's name and the number of uh, young men and women or boys and girls that were in there. And that's all because Dr. Burke wanted to, people to know who he was. You know, kind of like a tyrant like Milo Bell. How many of you knew about Milo Bell here? He was a tyrant, you know. Uh, Karen, can I ask, and, and Deborah, um, you know, as educators, uh, when we talk about uh, Omaha University, Karen, you mentioned the years that your that your relatives went mm-hmm. went there. And mm-hmm. um, my mother was one of two in her freshman year there. 
what was it about that school that they admitted black people? Well, it's like I told Dr. Robinson this afternoon, uh, from what I've been told, they just went on and, and applied and went through, they didn't go through a lot mm -hmm. of the stuff that people did, like, you know, Arthur and Lucy and, and some of the others, they just admitted them, you know, mm -hmm. but it wasn't easy, but they just admitted them. They didn't have to go through uh, what they went through in the South and other uh, Eastern colleges trying to get admitted. Mm -hmm. They just went in, took the classes and, and, and what have you. So that's, that's where that was. It was no special anything. They just enrolled and that was it. Yeah. yeah. I, I still have my mother's, uh, 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 and the uh, annual booklet from 1940 when she was a freshman at, at I think Omaha somewhere, University. I can't remember, maybe, uh, I don't know, but I think we still have an old uh, uh, Omaha U uh, Omaha book, uh-huh, uh, yearbook. yearbook, yearbook, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And, and another thing, Deborah, too, I know we're getting way out there, but Michael Maroney of the Omaha 54, they're the reasons why uh, OU isn't called the Omaha Indians anymore because they went in and had that name changed to mm -hmm. the Mavericks. Preston would remember because he's one of the elder statesmen of this. <laughs> watch, <laughs> watch yourself. <laughs> but no, uh, so out of all uh, the, uh, you know, with the, the people coming in uh, uh, from starting with my mother to even those of us that are there today, <laughs> we're still making landmark decisions and what have you, but yeah, Omaha has a different history, and OU and all the families, it's, it's something. But uh, you talk about Dr. Burke, I mean, those Black teachers were actually partying and dancing and singing because he put them through the dickens. And mm -hmm. so that's, a, that's another story there. But anyway, I had to get that in. <laughs> All right, so we, we, we're go, we've gone past time, but I want to <laughs> thank you all because, uh, I mean, but this was really, really interesting and fascinating. I mean, I, as each of you came to me telling me the things that you had discovered at your houses, you know, you all have been cleaning up and you found things and you say, oh, I found this. And so that's really where this, the inspiration for this all came together. Mm. Uh, so after this is over, uh, probably in the next day or two, I'm going to print out uh, some of these documents that that we've collected and, and put them out on the bulletin board so that people can actually go by and, and look at them and see just the really amazing historical documents that you all have uh, in, your, in your family archives. Uh, so I want to invite you all that are, are still around uh, to our next uh, webinar. It will be our last of the school year. Uh, but it'll be on Saturday at 11 o'clock. And we're having that special time because uh, one of our panelists is coming in from, from London. So, and they're six Ooh. hours ahead. So we gotta make sure that we do the time conversion. Uh, but we're gonna be talking to uh, Kandasi Chambiri and our very own Preston Love, uh, talking about uh, Black History children's books. So if people are interested in thinking of something new and exciting for Christmas gifts or Kwanzaa or whatever you celebrate and you want to give a child a book, they could think about books for, for Christmas nice. or Kwanzaa Very nice. or Hanukkah or whatever. Well, thank you, Professor Hurd. You've done a wonderful job. Thank you. A, a wonderful yeah. job. Well, yeah. thank you all. Thank you yeah. out there in the audience. Uh, I see you, Kat. Thank you. All of uh, our friends out there, if we don't see you again the rest of the semester, Please, please, please join us in January when we kick off the second half of our 50th anniversary. We've got a jam-packed semester of wonderful presentations and lectures, and we hope that you'll be able to join us for each and every one. If you're not able to join us live, please uh, go onto our website. There are links to all of our webinars, all the previous webinars, if you've missed any and you want to watch. So with that, I want to wish you all a good evening and thank you for joining.